I'm delighted uh, to be joined by our three speakers this evening and also our Jesus Professor of Celtic, uh, Professor David Willis, who will introduce our speakers. Uh, to give you a little bit of context to tonight's event, we had hoped that we would have one of our first major events in Wales uh, for, for many years uh, this month. However, owing to the complications of the pandemic, this has now been postponed until next year. So I'm delighted to say tonight will be a special preview of what we hope will be a very exciting event at the Welsh Senate in March 2023. So uh, to whet your appetite, I'll pass it over to David and our speakers. Thank you, thank you David. Okay, uh, Peter, Chris, I can see Baub, see where you mean any Hena. Welcome to this third instalment of Jesus Futures, uh, a six part virtual event series exploring the challenges and opportunities facing the world of tomorrow. Today's event focuses on the future of Wales um, and it will explore how the Welsh Senedd continues to adapt and look to the future, especially in light of the recent COVID pandemic. We're joined by uh, three um, Oxford alumni and friends from the Senedd who will be discussing how the institution can adapt and look to the future. Manon uh, Antoniadzi was appointed clerk and chief executive of the Senedd in April 2017. Before joining the Senedd, she was director of culture, sport and tourism for the Welsh Government, having been chief executive of Visit Wales. Earlier in her career, she had roles at the BBC and S4C, as well as serving two terms as private secretary to the Prince of Wales. She served on the boards of a number of cultural institutions, including the Heritage Lottery Fund, the London Philharmonic Orchestra and the Royal Shakespeare Company. She's currently deputy chair of the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama and a director of the Strata Florida Trust. Manon did a PhD in medieval Welsh literature and plays the harp. And she was a free scholar at Jesus College in 1989 to 90. Our second guest today is Hugh Williams. He came to Oxford in 1972 from Llanelli Boys Grammar Technical School to do a degree in law. He was one of the first cohorts to have been interviewed and taught by Peter Clark throughout um, his undergraduate studies. He was subsequently qualified as a solicitor and has spent his career in Cardiff, initially in local government, and then for 33 years in private practice, specialising in public sector and public law work. He was heavily involved in work connected with the regeneration of Cardiff Bay. Hugh has served as a trustee of both the National Museum of Wales and the National Library, and was for many years company secretary of the Wales Millennium Centre. After retiring from private practice in 2019, Hugh joined the Senate as chief legal advisor. Hugh says he'll always be grateful to Peter Clark for introducing him to administrative law, which has been the mainstay for what he regards as an interesting and varied career to date, to Geoffrey Hackney of uh, St Edmund Hall and later Wadham, from whom he learned about the usefulness and relevance of the study of legal history, and to Ruth Deitch, now Baroness Deitch of St Anne's, whose teaching of family law was a lifesaver when he somewhat unexpectedly found himself undertaking childcare cases in local government. Our third guest today is Anna Danielle. She came to Oxford in 1994, also to study law. She was also interviewed and taught by Peter Clark and Peter Murfield and thoroughly enjoyed administrative and constitutional law, but on the whole preferred the clarity of Roman and European law. She's pursued a career mainly in constitutional policy, lawmaking and strategy. She joined the Senate Commission in, 20, sorry, in 2004 uh, as the first head of the Senate's EU office in Brussels. She's since undertaken a variety of clerking roles in Cardiff Bay, including head of chamber and, uh, and table office, before taking up her current role, which focuses on strategic parliamentary development. She's responsible for the Senedd Reform Programme and led on the Senedd and Elections Wales Act 2020. Her portfolio of responsibilities also includes the Parliamentary Regulators, the Standards of, Con the Standards of Conduct Committee and the Independent Remuneration Board, which sets members' pay and allowances. As part of the Commission's response to, uh, to COVID-19, uh, she led the learning and futures work. Now, those are our speakers. We'll be organizing the event today by beginning with uh, Hugh, who will give uh, a presentation. 
And then um, we'll hand over, hopefully seamlessly, to Manon and uh, Anna, um, who will be um, uh, who will be um, doing a discussion uh, together. So uh, let me uh, hand over then uh, to our to the first part of that, uh, namely to Hugh Williams. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, David, for that introduction. Uh, before we hear from Manon and Anna about the functioning of the Senate, and in particular how it has arisen to recent challenges, I'm going to outline some of the elements of Wales's legal identity that underpin the present constitutional position of Wales and some of the future constitutional and legal developments that may alter or influence that position. So to begin, we need to go back a long way, a very long way, in fact, it is conventional now to start this discussion with reference to the codification of Welsh laws traditionally associated with Hawel Ab Cadell, known to history as Hawel Var, king of most of what is now Wales, who died around 950. However, as Professor Thomas Watkin QC has pointed out in his legal history of Wales, the British and later the Welsh people for a thousand years after the departure of the Roman administration lived according to their own laws. And Roman law notions of codification, and the importance attached to the opinions of jurists that also form a feature of the laws of Howell and their promulgation by the assembly drawn from all over Wales and traditionally associated with Hindi Gwynard Darf, today's Whitland. And these derive from that common legal inheritance which belongs to all of the peoples of the former Western Roman Empire. Furthermore, the failure of the Welsh princes to achieve any degree of permanent political union or to create a proto-Welsh state in the early medieval period meant that the creation and recognition of a single body of laws played an important part in the emergence of the Welsh as a united people. Professor Rhys Davis observes that the existence of this body of law was, by the time of the earliest surviving law texts we have, dating from the 13th century, but probably from earlier times, was a cardinal affirmation of the distinctiveness of Wales as a country and the Welsh as a distinct people. The completion of the Edwardian conquest of Wales in 1283 and the subsequent Statute of Rizal in 1284 brought the whole of Wales under the dominion of the English king. It also introduced Wales to the world of the common law as far as English criminal law was concerned. However, in civil law matters, such as inheritance, the laws of Howell continue to be used among the Welsh people themselves. The Boston Manuscript, so named because it uh, belonged formerly to the Massachusetts Historical Society, in which Manon in a previous existence uh, played a large part in preserving um, for the nation, um, and the dating from the 14th and early 15th centuries, which is now in the National Library of Wales, is an annotated working law text of the laws of Howell, which was used by an itinerant lawyer practicing in the Welsh marches. And its survival, along with the other texts of medieval Welsh law, is, a tan is tangible evidence of the continuity of the Welsh legal tradition after the, uh, after the conquest. The <clears throat> However, Wales's colonial status finally ended by the Acts of Union of 1536 and 1542, together known as the Acts of Union. These were part of the Tudor revolution of government pushed through by Thomas Cromwell. Although these are now most frequently mentioned in the context of the formal prohibition of the transaction of legal or public business in the Welsh language, the Acts also abolished Welsh law, applied English common law and equity uniformly throughout Wales, and importantly, gave Wales representation in Parliament for the first time. Nevertheless, justice in Wales retained certain distinctive features in the form of the Council of Wales and the Marches, which survived until 1689 when all the other prerogative courts were, were abolished, and the Courts of Great Sessions, which exercised criminal and civil jurisdiction in Wales until 1830. This history means that Wales now forms a single legal jurisdiction with England, known since 1967 as the jurisdiction of England and Wales. And this is different, of course, from Scotland, where the Act of Union of 1707 expressly preserves Scots law, and to Northern Ireland, where the jurisdiction is actually a continuation in part of the pre-1921 Irish jurisdiction. 
So the modern history of devolved institutions in Wales really starts with the establishment of the Office of the Secretary of State for Wales in 1964. This is some 90 years after the establishment of the Office of the Secretary of State for Scotland in 1885, and of course later than the establishment of the devolved Parliament and Government in Northern Ireland just over 100 years ago in 1921. In addition, the scope of devolution in Wales is narrower. Most significantly, justice and policing are not devolved to Wales. These remain the responsibility of the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office, respectively. This is notwithstanding that the former Secretary of State for Wales in John Major's government, David Hunt, now Lord Hunter Wirrell, um, has gone on record as saying that he had reached political agreement before that government lost office for the administrative devolution of those functions, which would have brought pre-devolution Wales into line with the pre-devolution position in Scotland. So broadly speaking, the situation we have today is that the scope of devolved functions in Wales follows the subject matter of the executive powers devolved on a largely ad hoc basis to the former Welsh office between 1964 and 1999. This remains the case and the pattern of reserved powers retained by Westminster following the Wales Act of 2017 in both their extent and detail still bears the imprint of these disparate uh, origins. In terms of constitutional law, the Dicean doctrine of the supremacy of the Crown in Parliament, derived from the Bill of Rights and the Glorious Revolution of 1689, remained the last word in Wales, right up until the Government of Wales Act of 1998. Of course, Westminster, the British state, had not been devoid of constitutional innovation throughout both the 19th and early 20th centuries, which saw institutions legislated for Canada, Australia, South Africa, New Zealand, for the government of India, and then, of course, extensively after World War II, as the sun set on Britain's colonial empire. It's an interesting counterfactual exercise to consider what the United Kingdom would look like whether we would be facing the current seeming instability of the Union, had not the sundering flood of the First World War halted the implementation of the Government of Ireland Act of 1914, and any further progress of the Government of Scotland Bill that received its second reading in the Commons in June of 1914. Home rule for Ireland and Scotland back then would likely have reinvigorated David Lloyd George's notion of home rule all around, perhaps leading to a measure of devolution to Wales some 75 years sooner than actually occurred. I'm conscious, however, that these talks are looking to the future. So I'd like to say something about the course of devolution to date from the perspective of potential future developments in some six areas, and of course, as an official of the Senate, I must do it from a politically neutral standpoint. First, we have the stability of the devolution settlement. By comparison with Scotland, the Welsh settlement has proved to be far less stable in constitutional terms. Um, we might also say that in party political uh, terms, things have been much more stable because of course we are this year celebrating the centenary of the Labour Party as the largest party from Wales at Westminster, an almost unparalleled uh, record of success in Western uh, democratic uh, um, politics. But as far as the constitutional um, framework is concerned, um, we, we have been in a state of almost continuous change. The characteristics of the inaugural National Assembly for Wales as a single body corporate on local authority lines was soon found to be unbalanced and a rolling series of committees, usually named after their chairs, Richard, Jones Parry, All Wales Convention, Silk One and Silk Two, culminating in something called the St David's Day process, have brought us to the present position, which is a legislature that holds the government to account and makes laws for Wales, save in areas where the functions are reserved to Westminster but free to determine its own procedures and electoral arrangements, and with executive powers vested in ministers accountable to the Senate, and the Senate itself with limited powers to raise its own revenues through taxation. 
The most recent legislative reform, arguably Devolution 3.0, enacted by the Wales Act 2017, was declared at the time to provide a permanent and stable dispensation, although, although this aspiration was actually dashed even before royal assent was received by the, the bill. The second th feature I would like to mention is the consequences of Brexit and now the UK's wish to amend or reform, depending on your um, perspective, the Human Rights Act of 1999. It's important to realise that a significant part of the glue binding Westminster and the devolved legislatures in the Scotland Act and the Government of Wales Act was the reliance on EU law to impose uniform rules on functions that were within the competence of the European Union institutions. In parallel with this was the reservation to Westminster of the Human Rights Act 1999, which incorporated the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law and which applied equally therefore across the United Kingdom. The implementation and application of the UK Internal Market Act 2020 and the Brexit legislation generally very much remains a work in progress for us at the Senate in terms of working through its consequences future lawmaking. But it is a likely source of future contention and indeed litigation as we explore the interaction of the Brexit process with the competence of the devolved legislatures. However, in terms of the Internal Market Act, the regulation of trade within the islands of uh, you know, the islands of Britain within the British Isles um, show that there is little new under the sun because it was during the reign of Charles II that the Secretary of State, that former principal of the college, Sir Eline Jenkins, opined that the union of the crowns and free trade were all that was sufficient to regulate relations between England and Wales and Scotland without the need for a union of the parliaments. The third feature is the question of devolution of justice and policing, which I've already mentioned. Um, the Silk Commission recommended um, devolution, but the St David's Day process of negotiation between the political parties at Westminster failed to find a consensus for the devolution of policing and justice, and consequently that remains, as I've indicated, reserved to Westminster. However, the Welsh Government commissioned the former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, Lord Thomas of Cumgeath, to chair a commission on justice in Wales, which carried out the most comprehensive analysis of the administration of justice within Wales has ever been carried out, which reported to the Welsh Government in 2019. The Thomas Commission's unequivocal recommendation that justice and policing be devolved nevertheless now forms the benchmark for future discussion of the interaction between devolved functions and the justice system and the policing. In this debate, it needs to be recalled that the other policy areas that policing and justice interact with are actually under the control of the Welsh Government and the legislative competence vested in the Senate. For example, children's services, mental health provision, prison medical services and education all these fall under the, under the uh, auspices of the devolved institutions. Next is the question of electoral reform, which we may hear more of in a, in a moment from Manon and, uh, and Anna. But an expert panel commissioned by the Senate in 2017 following the Wales Act and chaired by Professor Laura McAllister uh, recommended the reduction in the voting age to 16, which was implemented for the Welsh general election in 2020. And also they recommended an increase in the number of members of the Senate to between 80 and 90 members. And in this connection, you need, need to recall that at the moment we have 60 members, which means that the national legislature in Wales is significantly smaller in terms of size of democratically elected politicians than most of the local authorities um, in Wales. The question of the size of the Senate and also the method of election um, is under consideration by a special purpose committee of the Senate, which is due to report this coming May. 
and the cooperation agreement entered into late last year between the Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru in December 2020 contains a commitment to a Senedd of between 90 and 100 members. However, constitutional examination is not confined to um, the arrangements within Wales, because we also have a commission um, currently getting underway, jointly chaired by the former Archbishop of Wales and Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Williams of Oystermouth and Professor McAllister, on the constitutional future of Wales within the United Kingdom, with a remit to consider and develop options for the fundamental reform of the constitutional structures of the United Kingdom, in which Wales remains an integral part, and secondly, to consider and develop all progressive principle options to strengthen Welsh democracy and deliver improvements for the people of Wales. The Commission, as I say, is only just getting underway, so I cannot speculate on what its conclusions will be. However, there are voices across the political and academic spectrum arguing that devolution has given the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty its quietus, and that a new settlement that recognises the autonomy of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is required to prevent a breakup of the United Kingdom. So we will, we will, we will await with interest uh, as that commission deliberates over the coming years. Finally, I just want to mention, and in a sense this is back to the future, the consolidation and codification of a Welsh statute book. In 2016, the Law Commission published a groundbreaking report which had been commissioned by Sir David Lloyd-Jones, now Lord Lloyd-Jones and uh, Justice of the Supreme Court, on the form and accessibility of the law in Wales, which resulted in a commitment now enshrined in legislation by the Welsh Government to a sustained long-term programme of consolidation and codification of Welsh law to deliver social and economic benefits by ensuring that the laws of Wales are easily accessible. The first programme of consolidation bills, forming the building blocks of future codes, which is frankly a generational uh, task, but these are scheduled to come before the present Senedd shortly in the current session. So that is all I wish to say by way of an introduction, but providing the share screen works, I'd just like to close with a few um, uh, slides of um, some of the features that I've just been talking about. Here we go. Um, oops. Right. Um, Hopefully that is, um, there we are, right. Yes, as I mentioned, this is a, um, a, an illustration from a medieval Welsh law manuscript, um, Peniarth 28, which is in the National Library of Wales, and which is traditionally said to be a depiction of Hywel Var as the King of Wales giving judgment from his, uh, his throne. Um, Peniarth 28 is actually a Latin version of the, um, the Laws of Wales, which is in the ownership of Archbishop Peacham, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who wrote to um, Llewellyn the Great to tell him that the Laws of Wales were contrary to the, uh, the Laws of God, having the Archbishop having perused his uh, Latin version of the, uh, of the Laws. This is a copy of the, um, a facsimile copy, um, which is made for being transported to other locations of the Boston manuscript, which uh, I, I mentioned. This was created in the workshops of the National Library of Wales from the original. And in 2019, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom sat in Wales for the first time, observing the um, separation of powers. They sat in T. Howell, but only after the politicians had gone away for their um, summer recess. And we had the facsimile on display um, uh, in the precincts during the, um, uh, the visit. And here is Jesus alum, PhD, uh, sorry, DPhil alumna, Dr. Sarah Ellen Roberts, explaining the significance of the Welsh legal codes, the uh, third legal tradition of the British Isles, um, to uh, Baroness Hale of Richmond, the president of the Supreme Court, um, there with uh, Arthla with um, uh, Ellen Jones. And just to um, make the point, um, when the um, Supreme Court finished, we had this group
group photograph of the um, uh, justices with the support team. And we have the Lords of Hawilvar sitting on the bench in front of, uh, of Lady Hale. And I mentioned um, the oh, um, rather mentions already been made of the um, Senate and Elections Wales Act, which allowed the uh, National Assembly for Wales, amongst other things, to change its name to the um, to the Senate, Senate Cymru. And uh, this is the actual uh, granting of uh, royal assent to that uh, that bill. Um, we have the um, the first the first minister of, of Wales there next to a. Uh, to man on, um, but he's there in his capacity, his other capacity, I should say, as Keeper of the Welsh Seal, and he's just handed over the, uh, the warrant uh, to which he's affixed the seal, which actually, in our procedures, gives the royal assent to, to legislation. And uh, there next to man on is um, our Llywydd, um, uh, uh, who I can now say um, uh, after yesterday, because she was sworn to the Privy Council, is the Right Honourable um, Ellen Jones. And on the, the left next to the, I beg your pardon, on the right next to the First Minister there is our then Council General, um, Jeremy Miles, um, who um, remarkably for um, a boy from Neath actually managed to go to, uh, to New College rather than coming to, to Jesus. But, um, but there we are. That is, um, as I say, a, a photograph of the actual Royal Ascent of a Senev Act. So I will finish at that point and hand over, I hope, seamlessly to Manon and Anna. Can I just uh, butt in for a moment and remind people there will be time for questions afterwards. So um, if you have questions, you're welcome to write them um, in, the, uh, in the chat and I will, um, I will curate them um, at the end. So we now move over to, uh, to Manon and to Anna, and I think uh, Anna, Anna begins. Yeah, Dechrad David. Um, delighted to be here and taking part. Uh, Manon and I are going to talk about some of the key themes facing the Senev, but in a similar fashion to here, we might just start with a look back um, and see what that might tell you about the future. Um, and Manon, indeed, you were there at the very first day of the National Assembly for Wales back in 1999. What do you remember of that day? Oh, you're unmute. This is a fine start to our demonstration of um, a Senate's up-to-dateness. Anyway, this is a very 2022 sort of conversation about muting. But um, yes, thinking back um, those years to 1999, um, uh, again, this is going to sound a bit anecdotal after Hugh's uh, learned discourse there, but it, it there was a feeling of, of making history then. But the organisation was very, very different. Um, I joined what was then called the Implementation Unit in January 1999. Um, and uh, we had a very big deadline uh, of the first meeting of the uh, uh, of the assembly as it then was um, after the the elections took place in May of the same year. Um, and I, I just remember the whole thing being a whirl of um, incredible activity, trying to get the various services up and running. We were a much much smaller organisation then. Um, uh, we were part of a corporate body with a civil service um, uh, that worked for Welsh government, so that was complicated and and stressful. Um, uh, as one of the new recruits, I was virtually in half in, in charge of half the staff, including setting up the broadcasting contract, setting up um, vastly and a vastly expanded translation service because we we operate in two languages as we still still do and needed to do so from day one. Um, I was also in charge of the record of proceedings, and I've I've brought a prop with me, um, uh, namely this copy of um, uh, that I printed out of, or and photocopied of the the very first uh, edition of the. Of the record of proceedings, the, the the first one, which is a nice memento to have. I also um, remember this day fondly. This is the program for the first royal opening um, of uh, the uh, the um, uh, the assembly on the twenty sixth of May. I was just checking the date there, twenty sixth of May, nineteen ninety nine, um, and it includes in it um, the speeches given um, by the first presiding officer, uh, Lord Ellis Thomas, by. Um, David Wigley as, as leader of the opposition then by the Queen and the Prince of Wales and the Prince of Wales one rings a particular bell because of course 
Uh, I had just ceased being his private secretary when I came to do this job. And so um, it was pretty inescapable for me to end up coaching him in his, uh, in his Welsh language delivery of the speech. So it was decided that the Queen would give her speech in Welsh and the Prince would, uh, in English, and the Prince would speak in Welsh. So um, I remember that speech quite well. That brings back a lot of memories. Oh, and then when you came back then uh, in 2017 as our chief executive and clerk, um, as he was explained, it was quite a different legislature by then. So what struck you most when you took up your post? Oh, well, everything was bigger, um, more formal, more consequential. Um, uh, although still a young institution, it had witnessed and experienced many phases of change. Um, uh, as, as you know, you were here for most of those changes as well, Anna. Um, and um, in particular, of course, the referendum on lawmaking powers in 2011 significantly increased the Senate's areas of responsibility and consequently the demand on members' times. Um, and that's, of course, one of the key factors behind the current case for Senate reform is that members are very, very thinly stretched, taking care of their constituency responsibilities and their parliamentary duties. Um, you know, the members who, of, of uh, the governing party who are in, um, in the cabinet have, have vast responsibilities and the rest are commonly on two or even three committees, which is not something that, that um, uh, is a demand that many legislators make of their members. Um, it means that we as officials have to find ever cleverer ways to support them. Um, and uh, um, uh, that is uh, that is something that is a struggle that you and I are familiar with daily, Anna. Um, uh, I'd like to think that we're quite ambitious and progressive as a parliament. Um, that is a, an advantage of, of not having the huge traditions of Westminster. Uh, we are able to be agile when we need to be. And uh, we're fortunate that members have a, have a will to come with us on, on that journey. Um, uh, I think that you know the difference in powers, which has been much more marked in the last twenty years here in Wales rather than in Scotland, um, uh, has has led to a, um, a parliament that is ready and 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 uh, and, and eager for for more change. Um, I, I know you will be able to speak with more authority about the, uh, the the painful nature of some of that evolution when when it hasn't come in in great steps, but sort of drip by drip, drip drip on a case by case basis, as as happened during the third Senate. Yes, I remember the third assembly. It was um, I was clerking the LCO committee, uh, looking at the Welsh language LCO, and. Um, Yes, I don't think anybody wants to return to those days. Um, but I agree with you, the Senate has been ambitious from the outset. Um, and one aspect I think that's defined that journey is the willingness of the parliament itself to take ownership of its own future and its effectiveness as a parliament. You know, it's gone from assembly to Senate under the leadership of successive presiding officers who have um, really driven that change. Um, but I think it'd be good We'll, we'll talk about three or four different themes which are important for the future. So diversity in the Senate first, um, youth engagement, constitutional change, and what we've learned through the pandemic. So we'll see how we do for time, whether we get through all of that. Um, but, you know, when we think about the features of an effective parliament, you know, the feature that's at the top of every list is the importance of it being representative of the people that it serves. Um, and that starts with gender balance. Yes, absolutely. Um, and. Uh, we were the first parliament in the world to achieve gender equality in 2003. And at one point in the second assembly, which was the one that started in 2003 to 2007, there were actually more female than male um, assembly members. So although there's been a small dip in this figure since then, it's never dropped beneath 40%. Um, and the commitment to an equal Senate remains strong as ever. Indeed, um, you know, you will be aware as I am of the work being done by talented colleagues in the research department about creating gender, gender sensitive parliaments as well, which goes beyond having an equality of representation into infusing um, uh, consideration of this, this um, kind of equality into the way that we work. Um, the 2021 election also saw the first woman of colour to be elected to the Senate, Natasha Ashka, and um, uh, it's great to see her there now, although, you know, I think um, it, it prompts me to note that uh, we're not doing quite as well on ethnic diversity as we are on, on gender diversity um, uh, at the moment. Mm, oh, certainly. Um, yeah, it was one of the things that struck me, really, when I started working here in 2004 was the 
importance that members placed on having an inclusive culture here. Um, you know, the commitment to child friendly hours, you know, the requirement to use non gender specific language, and the high number of women in leadership roles as well in the Senate. Um, and of course, we're now in the third term uh, of a successive female uh, Llywydd, Ellen Jones uh, in a second term, and she was preceded by Rosemary Butler, both of whom have championed and celebrated women in public life and continue to do so today. Yes, I, I think it's probably um, a moment to mention um, our collaboration with the Women's Archive Wales um, called Setting the Record Straight. I mean, this has been a really, really interesting project. Um, it was building on uh, work started by uh, our deputy presiding officer in the last Senate, Anne Jones, and uh, she uh, encouraged members um, to donate their papers, get their papers in order and donate them to, to the political archive in the National Library for Wales. But we, we did, we couldn't fail to notice that um, men were doing this far more readily than women. Um, and so we we designed this project with, um, with the support of the Heritage Lottery Fund, as it then was, to try and capture the memories and experience of female Senate members in particular, both written and oral. Um, Obviously, the pandemic struck in the middle of this project, and it uh, posed many challenges for recording interviews with members past and present. But the producers were very ingenious, and um, no fewer than 55 in-depth accounts of life as a female member of the Senate have been documented um, and are now available on, on the website. And they're fascinating, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of material in them for future PhDs or DPhils. Um, and I think looking to the future again, um, it'll be interesting to see whether there is increasing public debate around having gender quotas uh, for future Senate reforms. And obviously all kinds of Senate reforms are being discussed now and gender quotas may form part of that. Um, uh, you and I um, uh, were, were much involved, Anna, in the work of, of an expert panel, which was set up during the last Senate, uh, the Assembly, you must forgive me if I overcorrect. I, whenever I feel tempted to say se Assembly, I, I correct myself to Senate. But in the last Assembly, um, uh, Professor Laura McAllister was tasked in, in 2017 with considering the future of the Senate. And uh, she recognized that our, uh, I'll quote here, our well-established international reputation for promoting gender equality was vulnerable because of this dip in, in numbers. And it made recommendations as to how gender representation could be safeguarded and how reform of the electoral system is an opportunity to embed equality into the future of political life in Wales. And so these are now issues being considered by the committee mentioned by Hugh earlier, the Special Purpose Committee on Senate Reform, which is due to report in May. Yeah, indeed. I've got a copy here. This is my uh, prop of the uh, expert panel's report. It's quite a hefty tome, but it is obviously bilingual, so only half the size, really. Um, <laughs> Yeah, one of the other um, of the expert panel's conclusions was the recommendations around uh, lowering the voting age. So its view was that votes at 16 could be a really powerful way of engaging uh, young people and raising the political awareness uh, of young people. But they were very clear as well that it had to be accompanied by um, you know, effective political and citizenship education. Um, and of course, that led to the Senate and Elections Wales Act, which he was talked about, um, which gave the right to 16 and 17 year olds to vote in Senate elections. Um, it was supported by 41 out of the 60 members, just over the threshold needed in the Senate for constitutional acts. Um, and I was quite pleased to see that having worked on the bill and delivering that bill was uh, good to see it go through at the end. Um, but for those who supported it, vote 16 is seen very much as a means of getting young people into the habit of voting early. Uh, raising their understanding of our democratic systems and crucially why it's important to vote. So a question for the future really um, is whether that will have the desired effect. Um, and we'll be keeping an eye on Welsh local government elections in May as well, where 16 and 17 year olds are able to vote again. Um, but this commitment to engaging young people in our democracy has been a consistent theme for the Senate. And I was wondering about your reflections for the future of that, Manon. Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that we discovered uh, looking at uh, the, the potential of, of, of the extension of the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds was um, it, it's very complicated 
how you assess the age of majority. Um, but uh, one thing that um, does seem to be the case is that the earlier you engage young people into the sort of habit of voting and, and, and using their vote, and then the more likely that is to continue and develop. So we've, we um, have had an excellent education team over the years whose role it is to engage with young people in schools and youth clubs all over Wales. And over the past 10 years, they've succeeded in engaging, you know, many thousands of young people directly with active inquiries before the Senedd and, and with the work of committees. Um, the estate closure gave us a challenge in that sense. Uh, we, we had to discontinue educational visits. Uh, and but we adapted really well to uh, engaging in new ways with the public in 20, 2021. Um, we delivered online information sessions, um, including to young people, to nearly 9,000 participants. Um, and this week, two years on, we've finally been able to return to hosting schools uh, in uh, for, for, for live sessions of, of, of plenary. I was um, clerking First Minister's questions on Tuesday when um, pupils from Caffili Primary School trooped in in a crocodile to the Oriel and all the members were so excited they all started waving at the children. So um, I should imagine they had a fairly good experience this week. Um, the Welsh Youth Parliament took that to a new level as well. Um, uh, we decided to um, create a youth parliament that would be partially voted by, by the young people across Wales and partially nominated uh, by organisations um, to make sure that we were reaching um, young people whose voices might not otherwise be heard. So um, groups of young people who might come from particularly disadvantaged backgrounds or, or a particularly notable perspective. Um, and uh, this pioneering forum uh, gave young people a meaningful voice. Um, uh, we're now, we just started the second youth parliament. The, the first youth parliament was a tremendous success and uh, um, the, the senior parliament uh, was very glad to pay attention to it. Um, the second uh, Parliament has decided that it's going to focus during its two years on mental health issues, on um, education and the school curriculum, um, and thirdly on climate change and the environment. So three issues which uh, I'm sure will strike a chord with young people all across Wales. And the young people involved have been absolutely extraordinary, and I've no doubt that we'll see them participating in public life long into the future. Indeed, I do hope so. Um... I think it'd be good maybe just to close with reflections on the on the pandemic and how that's affected us. You know, we've talked about the pace of constitutional change, but nothing has quite matched the speed of change for the Senedd that the pandemic brought about. Um, and we didn't really expect to be in this whole new world mm. of Zoom. Um, it certainly changed our perspective of the opportunities for the future, Manon. It has indeed. Um, and, you know, it started in the same way for us as for everybody else, you know, we were thinking very short term to begin with, realizing that we had to put any long term planning on hold. Um, but there was an absolute necessity to keep the wheels of Welsh democracy turning to in, enable the Welsh government to cast, pass key pieces of legislation um, and a recognition of the need for proper oversight, given the unprecedented powers being given to Welsh ministers and the importance uh, of ensuring that the Senate could discuss matters specific to the situation in Wales. In contrast to the situation um, 20 years ago, where we took months and indeed years to rehearse the new standing orders and so on, we transformed our work ways of working in a matter of days. I mean, we invented um, uh, new protocols, we tested them on a Friday and they went live the following week. Um, uh, we became one of the first parliaments in the world to meet virtually, which soon caught the eye of, of colleagues in legislatures across the world. And we were talking to uh, colleagues in Australia, New Zealand and elsewhere to share best practice or to ensure that democratic processes were not forfeited in a time of global crisis. Um, similarly, it's often been said that COVID in bringing us together um, uh, whilst forcing us, uh, us apart. So we were, we've were we been able um, during the lockdown to take part in events all over the world, um, uh, which are through, through virtual presence. Um, and, and I think that has, has been a, a marvelous way of developing this fraternity of clerks um, in, in many, many countries uh, without um, you know, the difficulty of, 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 of traveling. And I'm sure that that will continue. Um, as, as we go forward. I mean, one highlight of last year, which I, I must mention, was the uh, official opening. I, I mentioned earlier the first official opening of the first assembly. Um, the, the, this most recent opening was 
incredibly uncertain up until the day itself we were ready to press a button and uh, and and shift into an entirely virtual mode of operation we had all the artists uh, performances recorded on tape so that we could present them virtually if need be um, but we did manage uh, to have um, her majesty present uh, very meaningful and and important for our um, status as a, as, a, as, a, as a parliament, first time to be called a parliament, and very much appreciated the, um, the effort um, made by members of the royal family to come and join us on, on that day. And it was a really, really memorable event. And I think um, uh, if it's not pressing the time too much, we've got a very short video that pulls together some of the um, highlights of our lockdown in Senedd Cymru, um, uh, including a few shots of that memorable day in, in October last year when the Senedd was, was opened, Sixth Senedd was opened. Great. Thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers uh, uh, today. I'll just do a virtual, a virtual applause for you, for you all. Um, and um, thank you for that. Those, those fascinating, different, those very different perspectives on the uh, the history and um, particularly for us today, the future of the uh, the Sun Earth. Now. Um, uh, Please, um, you may ask questions by um, by putting them in the uh, in the chat, and I will uh, curate them um, for our speakers. While your um, while the audience is is um, getting their getting their thoughts together, um, maybe I could uh, start off myself by um, by asking a question. Um, it's sort of my professional obligation. Uh, to to worry about the Welsh language, so you won't be surprised that um, that I ask um, about uh, about um, the history. Well, the recent—I mean, I don't mean long-term history. I mean, what, what your experience of changes in the uh, use of use of Welsh in the centre, and perhaps also your your thoughts with respect to um, the sort of recent shift in perspective that I. Think we've seen in Wales from from thinking of promoting Welsh as being a set of regulations to to thinking of promoting Welsh as being 
the acts you know, every day in everyday life uh, that we promote Welsh by by speaking Welsh, not by not by legislating about it. Maybe Manon would be the. I, I'm happy to start off with with the use of of, uh, of Welsh in the Senate. It, it is. Um, it's been a fantastic aspect both times I've worked for the Senate uh, 20 years ago and now um, to be working in such a naturally bilingual environment. Um, and this was put to the test during COVID because, as you can imagine, you know, there were lots of lots of rules and regulations and protocols that had to be set aside because we needed to keep going. But bilingualism wasn't one of them. Um, and um, we had to take matters up as high as we could with Microsoft. I don't know whether anybody else listening had a similar experience, but they were very slow um, in uh, introducing bilingual functionality into their team software. So basically, we, we although it wasn't actually really sanctioned by um, the National Cybersecurity Centre at, at the time to use Zoom um, because of, you know, it, it, it was suddenly something that was being mainstreamed. Um, Zoom did offer us uh, that bilingual functionality. And so we, we leapt straight in there. We put various security mitigations in place and we've worked with Zoom to improve, improve their, their, their security rating there. So we're very confident that uh, that, that happened. But, you know, we, we didn't, didn't pause in terms of, of um, in introducing uh, simultaneous translation uh, in, into our proceedings when we went virtual. Um, we have, um, rather than a, um, when we recruit staff, uh, rather than saying that Welsh is either essential or it isn't, um, we have five grades of ability to speak, uh, read and write Welsh, and we specify for each job what level of ability is uh, is appropriate. And the, 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 the foundation rung, which is courtesy Welsh, is compulsory for all our colleagues. And, and that is, is a, you know, we consider that to be something that we can give colleagues that don't speak Welsh to begin with, because it, it just... Um, consists of facility in a, in a few phrases and the ability to use machine translation so that um, uh, they uh, are able to pronounce all the, the, the names uh, of, of the Senedd and the Llywydd and so on, and that they can just greet people and thank people in Welsh. So it's a very, very basic level of Welsh. So we do, um, uh, you know, we do operate as a naturally very bilingual organisation. Um, I feel I should have my daughter here to answer the second part of your um, uh, question because she works for Welsh Government on, on standards. Um, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I know what you're, um, you know what you're saying and I think it is something we will be facilitating and seeing this, um, uh, this debate gather pace um, as, as the government's plans come forward and are scrutinised here. Um, of course, we've, we've just had the very sad death of the, the of the Welsh language commissioner um uh, a month ago and so i think the um, um you know there is there is a, some change happening in that area now but uh, you know one can see the commitment of jeremy miles who he pointed out earlier was the council general is is now minister for education and um and in charge of of promoting uh, the, the the goals of, of the welsh language policy so we will be taking a great interest in seeing how that develops anna who do you want to add anything um, I'd just, just like to say um, that, I mean, you know, I've joined the, the Science Commission relatively, relatively recently, and um, I've been, in, you know, incredibly impressed by the way that the institution functions in both, both languages almost seamlessly. People, you know, they slip from one language in, into the other, um, and, you know, the encouragement that's given to you know people to learn and use welsh and in a completely sort of non-judgmental fashion i mean there's huge appreciation for you know anybody who you know make you know makes uh, you know you know uses uh, uses welsh and i think you know there there is this phenomenon of uh, you know people thinking that because you don't speak you know Hugh Edwards BBC standard Welsh you're not a proper uh, Welsh speaker well I don't you know I've not found that in the um you know in 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 in, in the Senate at all and I'm bound to say as somebody who you know lost their Welsh sort of in you know um, to a large extent in, you know at an earlier stage in my career but then picked it up um, from the time I joined the board of the National Library of Wales but then I you know the fact that I'm able to carry it on um you know 
now in the in the Senate. The, you know, it's been a you know source of great uh, great pleasure to uh, to me to be able to do that and to see what a you know a truly you know bilingual institution uh, can achieve. Great, Th uh, thank you. Um, so we have a um, we have a, a question from uh, David Ellis Williams. Um, for many people, it is the, it is only pandemic legislation that has brought home the fact that laws really are different in Wales. Do panelists feel this will encourage a more differentiated approach in other areas of law, or will there be a backlash? Well, it possibly if I kick off on, on, on that one. I mean, it it remains to be seen. Um, you know, I think that some of us thought that maybe the you know, the realization of how much of you know pandemic policy was being made, you know, in Wales and for Wales might have been reflected better in the the turnout um, that we had at the last uh, Welsh general uh, general election. You know, which is you know still something we have to work at in uh, uh, in Wales. And I mean, this is a completely sort of non party political um, uh, point because it's you know it's, it's important for the health of the uh, uh, of, of the democracy. Um, it's to be hoped, um, you know, that that, that the, you know the message is gra gradually getting through as to how much. Um, you know, of public policy in Wales is now the subject of um, of Welsh legislation, and indeed, it, you know, it, it, I'd encourage people to, you know, explore it further to realise some of the complexities that I only attempted to uh, 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 to touch on um, in in my presentation um, uh, earlier. Um, but as I say, you know, in uh, in in, in this. In many ways, I think the experience of the pandemic and what that has meant for lawmaking and um, regulation, in that sense, it's been as influential as all the stuff that we've, you know, discussed about, you know, virtual um, virtu virtual operation. And I think, as you know, we reflect on the um, on the pandemic and as as <coughs> um, you know, time. Uh, Time passes. I think people will become much more aware of, of what you know is the, you know, different distribution of powers, um, you know, in the in the United Kingdom now. Anna, do you want to come in? Yeah, I'd say, you know, the, the Senate has always um, has passed a few laws already which really do um, set it apart from maybe uh, policies in other parts of um, the UK. I, I think the pandemic certainly brought to attention you know, the, the extent of the Senate's powers in, in relation to public health matters. So I think maybe that's where the, the difference lies at the moment. But having said that, you know, the, the Senate is facing at the moment a huge amount of legislative consent motions. Uh, which is arise when uh, bills go through Parliament, the UK Parliament, and they require the consent of the Senate because they um, fall into areas of devolved competence. Um, and I think the the fact that we actually do are seeing um, a huge amount of LCMs going through the Senate, an increasing amount compared to previous Senates, does show that nonetheless, you know, there is um, the Parliament continues to legislate in areas that are devolved. And I think we we may well see that you know the areas that the Senate chooses to focus is its powers and its um, I guess from a Welsh government perspective its political energies may be those areas where it it wishes to be and develop a distinctive policies that are are necessary to um, address some of the particular issues of Wales. So yes, whether there will be a backlash um, depends on your political perspectives and what's being trying to achieve. <laughs> Okay, then we have a question from T. Burke. How wonderful that you achieved equality in the Senate. As a female in a technology field, I'm often the only female at the table. Having achieved such a great milestone, a, a quota is not a retrograde step. Um, Anna, you go. I, mean, I, I believe um, quotas were part of how, you know, quotas adopted by, by a party were part of how um, that equality was achieved in the first place. So, it, it, I mean, I, I agree um, with the questioner that it's it's not ideal, um, but it it might be a means to an end um, uh, to, to 
you know, re reinstate the the edge that we we once had um, in 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 that field. Anna, do you do you have your comments? Yeah, no, I agree, Manon. Um, it, it very much depends on the uh, the approach taken by the political parties, um, and when they do introduce quotas, then you know that's really what gives you the the high proportion of uh, women in the Senate, and so. You know, if you move towards a, a larger Senev, um, potentially with more parties in, involved, then um, then it very much uh, it's very much subject then to the um, the policies of those parties. Um, but one of the other recommendations made by the expert panel was simply to place a duty on parties to um, publish diversity data about candidates, um, and that would make transparent then you know. Um, maybe which parties were looking at the diversity of their candidates and taking measures to encourage um, different people to come forward. So, you know, there are different ways of achieving this, um, but I felt the expert panel certainly felt um, that this had international backing and there was evidence that this was an effective route to take. Um, I mean, there are issues to do with the legislative competence of the Senate in relation to introducing gender quotas, which means, you know, it's still a, a question mark as to whether that will uh, come into play if Senate reform goes ahead. So yes, it's not the, there are many different ways of achieving that, um, but quotas were certainly one of the most effective ways that the expert panel concluded. And just to, just to add to, 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 to that, without going into it in detail, but it's a, it, equalities is an excellent illustration of, you know, some of the difficult boundary um, issues that you know, a part of our sort of date, you know, bread and butter in the uh, in the Senate and especially legal, legal services, because the extent to which the Senate is, is able to legislate has competence within, within this area is, is quite circumscribed. And, you know, when you go into it, you start asking yourself questions as to, you know, why is it that restrictive? But it, you know, thereby lies a whole discussion about the way that the um, boundaries of devolved powers were, were, were drawn up in the first place, which I tend to, to illustrate briefly in my, uh, my section earlier. Thank you. Um, now, if I may take the next two together. Um, so a comment from Lori Hughes, the Senate's pioneering approach helped other Welsh organisations to use Zoom for translation. So to, to you all. And then a question, uh, to what extent will the Senate remain virtual as COVID recedes? Well, if COVID recedes. Um, I'm going to hand over to Anna on this one, um, because I think one of the really interesting things now is how we deploy the lessons learned during the pandemic and all the accelerated learning um, to uh, give us an advantage in, in going ahead. And, and Anna led a fantastic piece of work with her team last year, um, which looked at future ways of working um, and, and came up with, with a, a, an excellent report with a number of recommendations, which we're now um, taking forward in terms of the work of the staff of the commission. And indeed, the, um, it, it is being considered actively by our members at the moment. You know, not all of whom wish to be spending all of the week down in in uh, in, in Cardiff, Anna. Yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, yes, it's um, the report. We did that at the end of the the last Senate. So one of the most important things, you know, the reasons that we're here is to serve members, and so we needed to wait, you know, for the new set of members to come in and for them to experience what it was like to work um, virtually. I mean, they, they were obliged to work virtually during the COVID restrictions. Um, so, you know, they've had about two terms now of, of working in committees, um, mainly virtually, and having hybrid plenaries. Um, and so it, they're in a slightly better position now to reflect on, on their experiences to date. Um, I think, you know, what we found is that um, committees and plenary being able, well, certainly committees being able to meet virtually has uh, given rise to opportunities for more diverse witnesses to engage with committees and that's been a really important thing that we're now beginning to monitor more actively um, and that might help more people engage in politics. Um, I think it's interesting for members, you know, they can spend a bit more time in their constituencies obviously and dealing with their constituents which is really important to them and in particular to those who um, have longer travel times, you know, it's just very, as for everybody else, you know, working from home saves you an awful lot of time and allows you to use that time in different ways. Um, 
but it is a political institution and those relationships between members, parties, you know, us as staff and members is really important as well. So it's been um, good to see certainly far more members beginning to come back to the Senate now that the restrictions are loosening. So the business committee is responsible for setting the rules and the um, standing orders for the Senate, subject to the Senate's agreement. And so um, the temporary standing orders are in place that enable uh, virtual uh, proceedings will come to an end in August this year. So the business committee will need to have a look to see whether there's an appetite to continue to work uh, in that way um, in coming years and, and you know, when is it suitable to work in a hybrid format and when does it work better uh, to come in and work in person. I certainly think there's a difference between uh, the appetite to do so in committees compared to plenary, um, but uh, I certainly I certainly don't see it going away. Um, it is It certainly has opened up different opportunities for members um, to engage with people in lots of different ways, but it's kind of a question of watch this space really. Anon Hugh, do you want to come in at all? No, okay. So then, um, our, then I think this will be our final question. So I know we're, 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 we've gone over a little over time. Uh, where do you think the balance will lie between efficiency driven change and change in the extent of permitted fields of devolution in the coming 10 years compared to the last 10 years? Um, shall I um, come yeah. in uh, uh, partly because I, I, I noticed the name of the questioner and it gives yeah. me a chance to uh, remind um, his honour, um, Anthony says, Llewellyn, <laughs> that of course he uh, taught me um, contract and jurisprudence uh, um, law when he was a weekender <laughs> in his early days at the, uh, at the bar. But that's, it's an extremely interesting question. Of course, it is to a considerable extent a very political uh, question because it depends on um, how intergovernmental relations develop um, between the devolved institutions and uh, London and, and Westminster. And I think Anna may have, may have got something uh, she wants to come in on, uh, uh, on, on that um, uh, point. But certainly uh, from the perspective of operating the, um, uh, the, the system and the, distribu the, the distribution of powers, um, you know, to repeat the point that, 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 that I've made, there, there is considerable in, um, inconsistency, lack of logic and coherence in it. And that does um, have, you know, efficiency issues in terms of um, the time that has to be spent in, you know, navigating legislation um, around these issues or, address, or trying, to, uh, uh, trying to address them and whether the um, the outcomes in terms of the quality of the, of the legislation justify the retention of some of these um, uh, some of these jagged boundaries. I think is a, is a very uh, interesting and significant question. But in terms of the um, the large sort of issue um, in terms of the change in the distribution of powers, the the focus of the debate is is justice and uh, and policing because um, you know the more we create. Um, laws that are you I, I won't say different in Wales but are but are are, are specific um, to Wales because there is this codification uh, project that I uh, that I referred to then the fact that we don't have um, a uh, a domestic system of uh, of courts we have got some tribunals admittedly um, that is respond you know that is responsible for the um, uh, enforcement and adjudication of uh, disputes in relation to those laws, I think, is going is going to con be continue to be an area of difficulty. And um, you know, I, there are question marks over how sustainable it is simply under the under the pressures of operating the system, regardless of any ideological issues. So I shall leave that there. But I don't know if Anna wants to come in on the um, intergovernmental um, uh, relations aspect, because there have been some developments there. Yeah, that, well, that's right. Um, it, it's all kind of post-Brexit changes, really, you know, where um, the need for close intergovernmental working uh, to put in place kind of common frameworks um, to enable uh, seamless trade, if you like, within the UK um, has driven kind of greater intergovernmental working. And one of the areas that we're looking at at the moment, which is a kind of being discussed and raised far more frequently really is the extent to which we need to um, 
improve interparliamentary relations in parallel to that um, drive for closer intergovernmental uh, working. So I think that's a, an interesting area to look out for for the future as well. But I don't. I think you you covered the answer beautifully. I don't think I have much to add to that. So um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, then I think uh, it's time to draw our, our proceedings to a conclusion. Um, so can I just thank all of you um, once again, Manon, Hugh and Anna, um, for really, um, really eye-opening um, insight into the work of the uh, the Senate and uh, and it and its future. And can I also thank thank our audience once again uh, for for um, for their questions um, and for their interest. Uh, uh, today. Thank you very much.